Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Meridian Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's so good to see church family here together, united on this beautiful Sabbath morning. Bright blue sky, summer is here, and it's just wonderful. And it's also wonderful just to be in church with our brothers and sisters, here to praise the Lord. So please stand for our opening hymn, Number 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. to worship you because you are worthy, for you created all things. We would like to buy from you, to buy from Jesus, gold tried in the fire, a proven faith that can last until the end, white garments, a right relationship with you as we prepare for the end, and eye salve to anoint our eyes so the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. Please keep knocking on the door of our hearts so we can eat with you. Holy Spirit, help us to prepare for the days ahead. So I'm going to tell you all a story today about a little girl who grew up in South Carolina. Can you guess who it might be? You? Yes, it's me. So this little girl named Sally, who's me, but I'm going to talk about myself in the third person. So I grew up in, so she grew up in South Carolina. <laughs> and in South Carolina, it rains a lot more than it does here in Idaho. So it's very important to have a raincoat. And my mama took me out one day to buy a new raincoat. And she found me the most beautiful raincoat you ever did see. Now, for you boys, compare it to like getting the best bicycle in the world, okay? So when I'm talking raincoat, you're thinking bicycle, okay? So she took me out. She took me to buy this beautiful raincoat, and guess what color it was? Purple. It was purple, and it had big flowers on it, and it was shiny because it was vinyl. And I loved my new raincoat so much, and I was so proud of my new raincoat, and I was so proud of how beautiful I thought I looked in it. But there was more. Guess what else I got to go with my raincoat? No, good guess, but I got a, 
an umbrella. And guess what? My umbrella matched my raincoat. It was purple, and it had big flowers on it. And I just thought I was the coolest kid in South Carolina. I was so proud. I was so puffed up. Was I thankful to my mama? Yeah, she was pretty good. But I was really proud of how I looked. So I decided on this beautiful, sunshiny day that I would put on my brand new raincoat, I would put my umbrella up, and I would get on my bicycle, and I would ride down the street to show my friends. Keep listening. I forgot something. It's not an umbrella. I decided I would ride down the street and I would show my friends just how beautiful my new raincoat was and how beautiful and wonderful my umbrella was. And I'm riding down the street and I'm pedaling and I'm looking at my umbrella and I'm thinking I am the coolest kid in the world. Not just South Carolina anymore, the universe. And then all of a sudden, I ride my bicycle into my neighbor's mailbox. Oh no. oh no. There goes the umbrella. It is in pieces. I tore my beautiful new raincoat. I scratched my hands, my elbows, my knees, and I'm just in tears. And I have to go home and tell my mama. And I just knew she was going to be furious with me. But you know what? She was really kind. She showed me mercy. But I learned something that day. I learned something very important. In fact, it's amazing how so many things we learn are in the Bible. In Proverbs 16, verse 18, it says, First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. So instead of looking to myself with my beautiful raincoat and umbrella, I should have been looking at Jesus and being thankful. And I should have been thanking my mother, and I definitely shouldn't have been riding a bicycle with an umbrella open. So would anyone like to say a prayer for us today about how important it is that we not take pride in ourselves, but we take pride in Jesus and be humble? Would anybody like to do that? I'll do it. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for the lessons that we learn, even when they come hard, even when they involve umbrellas and mailboxes. And I ask, Lord, that you be with each child here today, that they will remember to look to you and not to that umbrella or bicycle or whatever it may be that they're proud of. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's go back to our seats. As we uh, sing our congregational song, which is actually going to be hymn number 426, and you're going to have to use your hymnal because we're making a quick change because uh, Pastor Michael was going to sing a, a wonderful song, I Want to Go to Heaven or want to go to heaven, I believe. And it was, it's a beautiful song, and I was looking forward to hearing it and singing it maybe with him, but not ready to sing it by myself. So we're going we're gonna to change that really quick, if you're all right with that, and go to hymn number 426, I Shall See the King. King, King, and the angels sing, I shall see the King someday, in a battle land on the golden strand, and with him shall ever stay, in his glory I shall see the King, and forever endless praises sing. T'was on Calvary Jesus died for me. I shall see the King someday. In the land of song, in the glory throng, where there never comes a night. With the Lord once slain, I shall ever reign in the glory land of light. In his glory, I shall see the King and forever endless praises sing. 
T'was on Calvary Jesus died for me I shall see the King someday I shall see the King all my tributes bring And shall look upon His face Then my song shall be how He ransomed me And has kept me by His grace In His glory I shall see the King and forever endless praises sing. T'was on Calvary Jesus died for me. I shall see the King someday. Next, um, like to invite you to sing with us, um, Create in Me a Clean Heart, O oh God, which I think you have the music for, right? Okay. Um, initially, we couldn't find the, the music book for it, so it was, uh, it's Praise 162, Humble Thyself in the Sight of, or Create in Me a Clean Heart, O oh God, sorry. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and your right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Okay, the scripture reading today is from Micaiah. Micah 6 8. Uh, he has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But I do justly, I love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And now we have our speaker, uh, Pastor Michael G. Mr. Benchy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> if you haven't ever heard that scripture song, has anybody ever, uh, who has not heard that before, that scripture song, uh, Created Me a Clean Heart, okay? It's from Psalm chapter 51, and it's interesting. It's one of these beautiful psalms where David has experienced some incredible trial in his life through his own sin. And as his pride uh, bloomed up in his life and he thought he was above reproach, it led him down a path that it eventually you know, caused him to murder one of his best friends, to commit adultery, lie about stuff. It was a terrible ordeal. And when he was confronted with this, his pride thankfully died along with that confrontation. And he humbled himself before the Lord. And so he comes to God and he confesses his sin. And he says, God, create in me a clean heart. Give me a new spirit, a new mind. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, please. And through that experience, David is able to recommit himself and his family and his kingdom back to God. And so this morning, our sermon title is Living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And part of what we're going to look at today is pride um, and how it affects, well, for one, we have a whole month called now the Pride Month, but also how it's much broader than that in our society today and how Really, pride is one of those things that touches every one of our lives at some point or another. And what does God have in store for us? Is that how he wants us to live? And does he have a remedy for us in our life? And so I'd invite you to please join me for an additional word of prayer before we begin, begin this morning. Our dear Father in heaven, God, we come before you and we want to ask that you would please, would be lifted up today, Jesus. We ask that you would touch our hearts and our minds and that through this uh, scripture readings today and our time together in your word, 
that we would see you and we'd also would have our eyes open to our own spiritual life, our own spiritual condition. And Jesus, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask that we would be able to hear you speaking to us today. And I pray, God, that you would be seen. For we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to live in Sodom and Gomorrah? We know somebody from Scripture who did live in Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you all remember his name? That was Lot. Lot and his family, they were residences down there in the cities of the plain. And good old Uncle Abraham had given them the choice of where they wanted to live. Lot chose to go and live down in these wonderful, bustling cities down there in the, in the plain. And as a result, he put him and himself and his family at risk of living in a community that was filled with sin and filled with all kind of, of, of bad practices. But Lot really didn't think it was that bad because obviously he stayed there, okay? He resided in Lot. I mean, in Lot. He, he resided in Sodom and Gomorrah. He enjoyed the, the, the pleasures of it. Well, maybe not all the pleasures, but he enjoyed the luxuries of being able to go down to the market and maybe go and see this and see that and all the people there. It was nice. You know, it wasn't bad compared to where Uncle Abraham lived up there in the hills. Eh, you know, Lot was a, was a, was a, a, cultural, a cultured man. He lived in a place where the thoughts and the feelings and the expressions were always abundant. And uh, as a result, he didn't quite realize just how bad it was where he lived. You've heard of the story of the how do you boil a frog, right? Okay, have you ever heard of the story? If you ever go down to Louisiana and you want to get yourself some frog legs, okay, and maybe you go to the grocery store and you get you a couple of live frogs and you go home and you want to boil them. Well, if you boil the water and you put your frog in there, what's going to happen to the frog? He's going to jump out. No, thank you. I would jump out too. The, smart, the frog is rather smart in that instance. So instead, the way that you cook a frog, uh, at least I'm, I'm guessing I've never cooked a frog, but I'm guessing this is how they do it, okay, um, is you put the frog in a pot of water, and he's swimming around. He's in his natural habitat. And then you slowly turn the burner up, just ever so slightly over time. And the water gets warm, and the frog is like, this is nice. This is like a nice bath. Gets a little bit warm, and he's like, oh, man, I'm at a jacuzzi now. And it keeps on getting warmer and warmer and warmer to the point that the frog doesn't recognize that he's boiling to death. And he dies in there, and he never jumps out because he could not tell the heat changing over a period of time. Lot was living in a place where perhaps over the course of his time there, the culture kept on getting a little bit worse and a little bit worse and a little bit more uh, uh, promiscuous and all these various things, and he didn't realize it because he was used to it. It was growing on him. Today, brothers and sisters, we are living, I believe, in a very similar culture as Sodom and Gomorrah's, and it's far more pervasive than uh, when we look at Pride Month and um, all, all the different um, you know, churches that are celebrating uh, pride and you probably have seen this before if you've seen it on Facebook or on TikTok or somewhere else on, on social media there are a lot of churches who have pride celebrations and what do we do with that how do we recognize uh, what the Bible says on the topic and for example the Episcopal Church they have something called a glitter blessing have you ever heard of a glitter blessing has anybody ever seen the glitter blessing before on YouTube Check it out sometime, okay? It's, it's rather interesting. But there's a company who sells these glitter blessings, and I'm going to read a little bit from their website, just real quick to get a, an insight. And I promise you this morning, this is not an anti-gay you know, uh, gay sermon or something like that, okay? You're, you're going to recognize this here in just a minute, okay? Uh, it's not pro-gay either, but uh, you, you get the idea. It says this, LGBTQ people are told the lie that God hates them and that they aren't able to be LGBTQ and a person of faith. We know better. This is from the Glitter Blessing website. Not only do we know fabulous LGBTQ people of faith and our clergy and faithful ourselves, 
<clears throat> we also know that God loves everyone, including, especially, maybe, those friends of Dorothy. Code word for, yes, you guessed it, fabulous LGBTQ people. So here they're saying, you're allowed uh, to, to have this lifestyle and to, and to do this sort of thing, and God totally accepts you just the way that you are, and all these various things. Now, there's components to what they're saying that is true. Does God love everybody? Absolutely, okay? Because if God didn't love sinners, guess what? We'd all be in tough luck, wouldn't we? All right? Question is, <clears throat> what do we do with the sin? What do we do with the lifestyle? What do we do with the inclinations? It goes on to say, glitter blessing is an opportunity for clergy, faith communities, and everyday beautiful and loving people to share that, uh, share that love of God with LGBTQ people and allies. The biodegradable rainbow glitter and blessing frankincense scented holy oil from jerusalem is packaged in a beautiful glass vial ready for you to share each vial is shipped with love and blessings to you and for your community and so a lot of churches this month have been celebrating these glitter blessings where they invoke the blessing of god in order to uh to to, to celebrate something that god really doesn't celebrate okay um so the question becomes, can we bless something that God himself has not blessed? Can we bless something, invoke God to bless something that he has already said that he can't bless? It's a good question. And I believe that the answer is no. And so what do we do with this? And I know that there's a lot of people, even within the Seventh-day Adventist church, a lot of faith communities who love Jesus, but yet they wrestle with this identity, this sexual orientation. What do we do with this? And also in our life, <clears throat> you might say, well, that's not my, uh, my cup of tea or whatever else. But every one of us has something that God is working with us in our life that he is saying, I want you to lay down. I want you to yield. I want you to put this thing down because it's not good for you. And we all come to the exact same crossroads where we say, the scriptures tell me one thing. I feel one way, a different way. What do I do now? That becomes the question and the crosshairs for all of us. And Pride Month is just, it's a very easy way for an illustration to point out something that affects every single one of us. Uh, from our children's story this morning, thank you very much for that. You know, pride does come before the, the crash, as the NIV puts it, right? Uh, it comes before the fall. It comes before destruction. And so is pride something that we need to embrace? Is that something that we need to celebrate? Is that something that we need to incorporate into our faith? The society that we live in tells us that you are the way that you're supposed to be and be proud about it. Well, when I was a little child, I probably hit some kids over the head with some toys, okay? Uh, does God want me to hit people with toys? For the rest of my life. Are you sure? Who, who says they want to get hit by a toy from the pastor? Nobody, right? Or a dump truck, right? I got, I got a big scar right here. A kid threw a gun at me. You remember that? I had blood coming down my face. I had to get stitches and everything like that. <clears throat> we are born one way, and God is constantly trying to help us to be another way. He's trying to give us a better path. He's trying to lead us into a better way of life. He's trying to reform the inward man or woman to reflect him more perfectly. Being prideful about things that we do, I don't think we find that being in Scripture, okay? So can the Christian celebrate Pride Month? If you have your Bibles with you, or if you've got it on your smartphone, I would invite you to please turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. So Matthew's in the New Testament, the very first book of the New Testament, and it's one of the four Gospels. And uh, Matthew is a great read because it gives you a huge overview, a very thorough overview, really, of the Gospel of Christ. It tells us his story from beginning to end, and it's one of the richest Gospels, in my opinion. I love Matthew. So Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read verses 21 through 23 together. So Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. It says the following. Jesus here is speaking, and he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sermons ever preached on the face of the planet. He says, I should say one of the best. It is the best, the Sermon on the Mount. He says the following. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, and the day that he's speaking of is the day of judgment, the day that he comes back, the day of, the, you know, who's in heaven, who's not in heaven. On that day, they, many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. So here, Jesus himself is telling us that there is a class of people in church, people who call on the name of Jesus. They like Jesus. They want to do the things that Jesus wants them to do. And, but there's still something that they are holding back on in their heart of hearts because they are practicing lawlessness in their life. And as a result of that lawless practice, they end up not even, not even knowing who Jesus really is. So the question becomes, am I practicing lawlessness in my own life? Am I practicing the kind of faith that Christ has called me to? Or do I just have a cultural Christianity experience where it's, I go to church, I have a good time, and I put a little Jesus uh, sticker on my car. Do you follow Jesus this closely, right? You've seen the, the bumper sticker, right? Um, yeah, I put one of those on there, and then I'm, I'm good to go. Or is Jesus really in the business of getting to know us personally, to reform us? When I was a young man, you know, I did drugs and, and drank, and I would oftentimes smoke pot on the way to youth group. Think about this for a second. I like Jesus, but I also like marijuana a lot too. And just to let you know, those two things don't mix that well, all right? I thought they did. I said, you know what? When I smoke pot, I can study the Bible so much better. But after a while of doing that, I just started smoking pot more and reading the Bible less, okay? When I came to the crossroads of learning what God has in store for me, that he wanted to change my heart. He wanted to actually be my Lord, my Savior. He wanted to be my best friend. And he says, Michael, these things aren't good for you anymore. you got to let this go. you got to let this thing down, put it down. I wrestled with that because I really enjoyed that part of my life. But when I saw that Jesus wasn't trying just to keep me in this Rastafarian uh, utopia, he wanted to change the inward mind and heart that I had inside me. He wanted to give me a new life and a new experience. And so I came to a point where I had to say, am I willing to let this, go, this, this habit go? That way I may be able to be close with Jesus. And praise to God, uh, praise to the Lord that he enabled me and helped me to let go of that habit. You see, there are a group of people who think they're doing what God wants them to do. But all the while, they look at this and they say, this is outdated. It's not fit for us anymore. That was for one time and one place and for one group of people, but it doesn't apply to us anymore. They're reinterpreting scripture to base, uh, through the lens of our cu current culture. And as a Christian, we can't do that. The Bible tells us in Leviticus 18, 22, it says, You shall not lie down with a male as with a female, for it is an abomination. So if God calls something an abomination, does he later change his mind about that? Are you sure? You're positive. Okay. God calls us not to remain in a life of destruction, in a life of sin. He didn't come to save us in our sins and to keep us there. So that wasn't his point. He came to, del to deliver us. And you're, you're still in Matthew, right? Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Let's see what one of the things of Jesus' job, his mission, was going to be. <clears throat> verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It's very interesting. It says, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay? Now, 
this is good news, all right? <clears throat> I'd be a little bit more enthusiastic if my voice wasn't evading me so much, okay? This is great news because if you have been struggling with something in your life, if you've been struggling with some sort of a sin or trying to reconcile with your past of sin and you, you still have a, a burden of guilt in your life and you say, I don't know how to let go of this thing. I don't know how to be free of this <clears throat> thing. I don't know how to get these hooks out of me. Jesus' mission, we know from the scriptures, is to deliver you from that. And if we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I've got this issue, he says, great, because I'm an expert in cleansing you from that issue. I'm, I'm really good at this. I've never lost a patient. That's how good Jesus is. He's got a 100% success rate. If we go to him and if we yield ourselves to him and we say, not my way, not my will be done, but thy will be done, and we yield ourselves over to him, and allow him to do the very thing that he wants to do in our life, he promises that he can do it. Which means that the new life in Christ is a reality for us. The new identity, the whole, I, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, that's a reality. It's a promise. And if God has promised it, think about this. Can God lie? Thank you, Cedar. Yes. <clears throat> God can't lie. He always tells the truth. I've told you this before. If Elon Musk was standing right here, and I was standing right here, and we pulled out our checkbook, all right, and each of us wrote a check for $1 million, whose check are you going to take? Mine. <laughs> not mine. That's right, not mine. You're going to take his. Why? You know it's not going to bounce, okay? Mine will bounce off from here to Mars. Elon Musk will be able to pay you to go to Mars, you know, so there's a difference there. When God makes a promise, he cannot lie. The condition for the promise to be realized is me trusting in Jesus to fulfill the promise in my life. It has never been the condition of me going, all right, God, you promised to forgive me of my sins, but I'm going to go and beat myself in order to earn this. I'm going to work really hard in church in order to earn this forgiveness. That's not how that works. Martin Luther, he, was exper he experienced this whole thing. You know, he was a Catholic priest, and he knew about God's forgiveness and whatever else, but he felt the enormity of the guilt of his sin. And so what would he do? He had these things, that, these little chain things that would... Uh, strap on your leg and that would cause a lot of pain so that all throughout the day he could remember oh the pain I need to I need to ask for forgiveness from God I need to be penitent and in, and in his monastery he would take these these whips and he'd, he'd hit himself with these things in order to really earn the forgiveness of God so that way he could feel the pain of his sin and one day as he was trying to earn his forgiveness going up the Santa Scala there in Rome on his knees doing the Hail Mary all the way up, hoping to get some sort of a relief from the guilt of sin in his life, the scripture came into him like a bolt of lightning and said, the just shall live by faith. And at that moment, he stood up and he says, I will never do this again because the scriptures say it is by faith that my sins are forgiven. Not of works. It's a gift of God. God is calling us to let our pride go, brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a kind of a new creation. Is that what it says? No, it says that he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you want the new in your life, brothers and sisters? Do you want that transformation that Jesus alone can provide in your life? Trust him with it. Ask him. If you pray, you go home tonight, get on your knees before you go to bed, and you say, Jesus, I want whatever gift you've got. Whatever thing you are wanting to supply for me in my life, I want to receive that. 
I don't know what this looks like, but I'm going to trust you to be my Lord and my Savior, to deliver me from my addictions, to break me free from these things that just leave me empty and feeling dirty inside. I want to have a new experience. If you make that your prayer, he will show up in your life because he is longing. This is like the one prayer you can guarantee that he's going to answer. You know why? He died to save you. So he's just sitting there waiting for you just to open up that door so that way he can come in and give you the blessing that he wants to provide for you. And so often we feel like we've got to earn it. We don't feel good enough. We don't feel worthy enough. We don't feel like this is for us. It's for somebody else, but it's not for me. It is for you. If you're here today and you're alive, I promise you, and if you're awake, okay, uh, even if you're asleep, it is for you too, okay? God has got this gift with your name written all over it. And he wants that for you. But sometimes when we read the scriptures, we come across something that we don't really like. Has that ever happened to you? We talked about this today in Sabbath school. And I asked Harold, I said, Harold, have you ever read something in the Bible that made you say, ouch? And, you know, he's obviously was like, oh, yeah, many times, right? When we come up to those ouch texts, you know, usually what it's doing is it's pointing out something that I like, you know. Uh, for me, it was uh, when I read that, you know, bacon and, and pepperoni is not something that God designed for us to eat. I said, say, what? No way. Because my right leg is made out of bacon. I love that stuff, right? It tastes so good. There's a reason why people eat it, okay? But I read that and I said, if the guy who made me, who created me, who designed me with my, all the functions of my body, he says, this thing is not the best for you, should I listen to that or not? I guess I can trust him with this. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. It's like going, up, going over again to the Elon Musk guy and saying, hey, listen, you know, this cyber truck thing you got, this is really nice if you say to plug it in here. But you know what? I'm just going to, like, uh, not plug it in, you know? In fact, I'm going to drill a hole in there because somewhere you've got to have some gasoline. You don't put a gas. I'm going to drill out that uh, electrical thing. I'm going to put gas in there, okay? Because I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. Is that truck going to work? Not a chance. It's not going to work. In the book of Daniel, we read of a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, if there's ever been a prideful person on the face of the planet, Nebuchadnezzar is the guy, all right? He is pride to the top. I mean, he is like looking around at this beautiful city that he's made. He's like, I am the man, okay? There's no question in anyone's mind of who's the boss. Nebuchadnezzar definitely is the boss. So in Daniel chapter 2, God gives Dan uh, Nebuchadnezzar a vision. And he tells him of this huge statue, heads made out of, do you remember? Gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And Daniel comes in and gives him the interpretation and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, but after you and your kingdom, there's going to be another kingdom, inferior to yours, that's going to rule the world. If you're Nebuchadnezzar, do you like that news? No, you want to make America great again. You don't want to say China's going to come and take over, right? You don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. Nebuchadnezzar's like, not a chance. I don't like that. So in chapter 3, what we find, excuse me, let me grab my water bottle. In chapter 3, what we find is Nebuchadnezzar building a giant statue. But this statue does not mimic or, sem or resemble, really, uh, in, in, in truth, the vision that God had given him. So the word of God had come. There's a giant statue, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet partly of iron, partly clay. That's the word of God. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar says, I like parts of that. In, in particular, I like one part, but I want that one part to be everywhere. Okay? And so he makes the entire image out of gold. The entire statue. He makes a, a literal huge statue with gold. Okay, he's got the power to do it. He makes this giant statue of gold, and he says, if you don't like this interpretation of the vision, uh, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. We're going to just kill you. A lot of days, a lot of times today, what we do as Christians is we make our own image of gold out of the text that God has given. Reread that salvation is a free gift. Okay, and we take that and we smear it all over the whole thing about obedience. 
We say, you know what, the whole thing about, you know, yielding my life and dying to self and, and uh, allowing Jesus to live inside me, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. No, 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 I don't, no none of that stuff. You know, none of that whole, like, life of sanctification, you know, none of that. I just like the verse that says God loves me and that he's going to save me. And so I can stay the way that I am. I just got that, that, that gold and just cut over the whole thing. Is that safe for us to do? It's not. Not safe at all. We're taking something out of Scripture that is true, but we're neglecting the rest of the truths that Scripture contain. And when we look at Scripture, brothers and sisters, we got to take the whole thing as it says. If we're trying to try and cherry pick out of it, we're doing exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. And he did it out of pride. He did not want to submit to what God was doing in his life. He didn't like it. And there are things that the scriptures point out in my life that I don't like because it's sinful. But God is saying, this thing in your life is not good for you. If you let it go, I will heal you from this. I will cleanse you from this. I will give you a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. And I will give you the desire to do the right thing. You know, oftentimes we cherry pick in scriptures also. You've heard people say this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, you're almost there. Fear and trembling, okay? And you hear this oftentimes from the very conservative crowd that says, you've got to really do this, you know? You've got to just butt, grab your feet by the bootstraps and pull yourself up to heaven, right? You've heard this. But the scripture continues to say the next verse over. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. In verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we work out our fear and trembling because God is inside of us. We're standing in holy ground on 100% of the time. He's giving us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit to have a desire to do the right thing and the ability also to do that thing. So many times, like the, the Apostle Paul, we say, you know, I know what's right. I know what I should do, especially when the alarm clock goes off early in the morning, you know. I know what's right. I know what I should do, but I just want to hit the snooze button. You know, I don't have the ability to, to, to get up out of bed, right? Can anybody else testify to that one? All right, maybe I'm the only one. All right, amen. There's a few more. Okay. It's this battle between the mind and the flesh, right? Now, it's a simple illustration, but we do this with a lot of things that are called addictions. And it's interesting the, the chains of addiction are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. You find yourself slowly entertaining some habit, and after a while, you can't break that habit. You don't know how to free yourself from that thing. And Paul experiences this in the book of Romans, and he says, who can deliver me from this body of death? But thankfully, he doesn't stop there. He says, I praise God because of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's able to deliver me. That's a paraphrase. It is through Christ that we receive the new heart, the new mind. It is through Christ that the chains of addiction in our life that are broken. He has the power to be able to do this. And it's high time for us as Christians to call upon the name of Jesus. There is no greater name in all of the universe than the name of Jesus. That name has power. And it's in the name of Jesus that the apostles did X, Y, and Z. It is in the name of Jesus that we have victory. It is in the name of Jesus that we are able to approach the throne room of God today. Brothers and sisters, this is not some sort of a nominal thing. This is not some academic study. This is the real deal. When you have the name of Jesus and you plead to the Father through the name of Jesus... He will provide you that which you need. Probably don't need a Ferrari, so don't pray for that one. But forgiveness of sin, a new life, freedom from the burden and the weight of guilt, these various things, God wants to deliver this to us. But oftentimes we come to God on our own terms, and what we're doing is we're providing to God in worship, in our own way, profane fire. If you're familiar with the, uh, the book of Leviticus, chapters 9 and 10 really give us a very interesting picture about the worship service, of bringing an, an offering to God 
laying it down on the altar and how to, to prepare it and all these various things. And then fire coming down from God and consuming this, this uh, sacrifice. In chapter 10, we read about um, the high priest. His name was Aaron. He had two sons, Nadab and Abihu. And Nadab and Abihu, they loved worship, but they wanted to participate in their own way. They knew exactly what God said were, was the, you know, the steps, the directions, okay? But they were good men, and they ignored the directions. Right? Anybody ever put together a bicycle on Christmas Eve? I've done that before, and I ignored the directions, and I said, oh, i got to go back to the directions because I, there's no way I can figure this out, right? I just want to jump in and figure it out myself. They didn't have to buy who I think they were like that. They wanted to jump in. They said, you know what? We know what God says, but it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, God loves us. It doesn't really matter. And so what they do in Leviticus chapter 10, starting in verse 1 through 3, it says the following. If you've got your Bible, please turn there. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Just check to make sure that your pastor is telling you the truth, okay? That's what you want to do. Always do not take my word for it. You've got to read it in the Bible for yourself. It says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Is, it, is God concerned with the peculiarness of, of worship? Does God call the shots, or do we call the shots? God is, right? He's God, okay? So we need to allow God to be God. They'd have it abide who they wanted to do something their own way. Verse 2, it says, So fire went out from the Lord, and devoured them not the sacrifice but it devoured them and they died before the lord and moses said to aaron this is what the lord spoke saying by those who come near me i must be regarded as holy and before all people i must be glorified when we go to god we need to recognize that he is god that he has the power to change my life it's not in my own strength it is in his strength also, when God prescribes a certain lifestyle for us through the scriptures, we need to trust him with that. We need to trust him that he knows what he's talking about. At the end of the day, he is God. He made us. He knows what's best for us. And so I want you to turn, as we are about to close, to the book of Ephesians. Again, this is in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's letters. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. Ephesians chapter 2. So Ephesians chapter 2, we have this beautiful text that really kind of leads us in the direction that God wants us to go. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1, and it says this, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, and in which you would in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Just pause there for a second. Paul's illustrating that everybody has got this past. We go through our, uh, by, we live our life through the culture, through the lens of culture, and we do the things that our body wants us to do, the lust of the flesh, okay? That's how we are without Christ. We just, we're just wanting to do what we want to do. And then he picks up in verse 4, it says, but God, but God who is, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. God is calling his people today to lay down the pride of life, to lay down our sinful lifestyles, and to recognize that God is creating us for good works that he has ordained. The whole pride month, the whole, you know, this, it's, it's really a trap for Christians, and here's why. God's word tells us this is a lifestyle that he cannot condone, okay? He cannot give his seal of approval on this lifestyle. But the pride initiative, the pride organization, you know, this whole culture says embrace who you are. God wants you to be this way, and you don't have to change. Now, when we look at that, we can say, oh, yeah, that's, that's something wrong with that. But look to yourself. What area in your own life are you proud about that God is saying he doesn't want you to be living that way? We embrace some sort of a thing in our life, some sort of a, maybe we say, you know what? I don't want to do anything for God. You know, I like Jesus, but I'm not going to tell nobody about it. Is that what God says? No, he says, go to the whole world. You say, well, you know, I, I know what God wants from me. He asks, you know, 10% of my, my increase, and, but I don't want to do that because I've already given up to the government and, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't have any more. Is that what God's asking us to do? Oh, and I know it's hard. I know our, our, our economy is tight and all that sort of stuff, but guess what? It's an act of faith, and God is able to provide to us that which we need. When we look at areas in our life where God is saying, you need to put this down, and we say, you know what? I don't want to. It's like a toddler having a dirty diaper. You know, and we have some fights trying to change Hudson's diaper, okay? He sits there, and he's got, a, you know, he's, it, it, it's stinking in the room and stuff like that. And we say, come here, let's change your diaper. He says, I don't want to. I know it stinks, but it's warm, and it's mine. And he wants to hold on to it. And he'll fight you to keep that dirty diaper on, okay? He knows it stinks. But it's warm, and it's his. We're holding on to dirty diapers in our own life, aren't we? There are sinful things that we, you know what I'm talking about. Every, everybody is in the process of sanctification. We are learning, we are growing with God, and God is constantly showing us other things in our life, okay? That's why it's a journey, okay? You're always going to be growing closer and closer to Christ. You're never going to arrive, I don't think. You're always going to be learning about Jesus. God is always going to be giving you victories over things, but then he's going to say, by the way, there's the next one. You know, there's the next chapter. I'm going to keep on helping you through this. And it's going to get easier. There's going to, you're not going to be doing cocaine anymore, okay? But you're going to, you might gossip some, all right? God's going to try and, and help us all out, I think. But too often we say, you know what? I'm good enough. I'm going to keep this one dirty diaper, and I, the rest of it, I'm, I'm, I'm good on that, but I'm going to keep this one dirty diaper, and God's saying, I want that one too. Are we going to let that go? Are we going to allow God to, to take that from us, or are we going to hold on to it with a death grip? Our last text that we'll look at, I better not say that because there might be one more, but 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians, Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is a good text. And I know we've, we've talked about pride and LGBTQ and all that sort of stuff, but we're going to read a list here. And I want to ask you a question. Is this only pinpointing one certain kind of sin? Okay? Uh, we're going to read this list in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 9. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. All right? So God does not want us to be deceived, right? There are people in our culture that are, they love Jesus, but they are being deceived because of they, they want to embrace something. Okay? He's saying, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Don't be deceived. Regardless of who tells you, don't listen to that. Listen to this. He says, neither fornicators, as people who have, uh, sex outside of marriage, nor are idolaters as people who worship things that are not God. And we can worship a whole lot of things that are not God, right? We can worship money, power, influence, whatever it is, you know, position. We can worship a whole lot of things. Nor are adulterers, that's married people sleeping in the wrong bed. Nor are homosexuals, 
I think that's the effeminate one here. And then there's sodomites. That's the masculine one. It's, or it's, it's vice versa. I, I can't remember that. Nor thieves, people who steal things, and sometimes we rob God of stuff in our life. Nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So is this only looking at one segment of society? Is this kind of broad base for everybody? It touches a lot of groups right here, doesn't it? So if we are embracing a lifestyle that God calls sin, is that something that's good for us in the long term, yes or no? No. God is calling us to let go of these things. And every one of us, at some point, has checked off one of these boxes. And yet, what does that leave us with? Thankfully, the text continues. In verse 11, Paul says, And such were some of you. That's past tense or present tense? That's past tense. You were that way. Some of you were like this. Some of you did this exact same thing, including me, by the way. I murdered people, right? Paul's saying this. Okay, I haven't murdered anybody, I don't think. I, have, I know I haven't. I know I haven't, okay? But maybe in my heart I have, okay? Jesus does point that out in the Sermon on the Mount. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When you come to Jesus, I don't care what you have been doing. I don't care what your lifestyle has looked like. When you come to Jesus, his intent is to change and eradicate your past history. He wants to give you a hope and a future. On the cross, his death satisfied the wrath of God towards us. Okay, The wages of sin is death. And Jesus came and he died that death for you and me on the cross. We are justified in the eyes of God in that moment. We are baptized, okay, because we accept that gift. We are washed when we accept that gift, what Jesus has done on the, cr on the cross. And we are washed of our sins. It's like being real muddy, okay. And you don't want to get uh, just a little drop of water to clean all that mud off. No. You need to get, you know, you need to stand underneath Niagara Falls, and that's what Jesus is going to do through baptism. He's going to wash away those impurities. And then he says we're sanctified. And the sanctification is when the Holy Spirit comes in your life. And every day he is helping you to gain the victory through the merits and blood of Jesus Christ. Every day he is helping you by saying, oh yeah, by the way, Michael, you did a great job. Praise Jesus. You have victory over there. But look, there's one more thing over here. And now we're going to go through that process together. And I'm going to lean into Jesus. I'm going to ask him for help. I'm going to ask him for victory. And he's going to free me from those things. And God is giving us the victory. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, it's time for us to recognize sin is what it is. And we can't excuse sin in our life any longer. We need to allow Jesus to reform and to change us by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and by his good grace. He wants to enable us to do the very thing he's called us to do. And through Jesus, we have victory. Brothers and sisters, do you want to this week to say, God, I want you to show me something in my life that maybe I don't recognize as I'm being prideful about. I want you to show me something that's a, a hang-up for me. Anybody want to do that one? That's a hard prayer to pray, okay? Because he, he'll show it to you, all right? Second one is you want to say, Jesus, I want to have complete victory in you. I want to have freedom from my past, freedom from the burden of guilt, of sin. I want to have liberty, and I want to have life abundant. Is that your desire? You want to have that kind of a gift from Jesus, okay? And the third one is you say, Jesus, I haven't tried this out before, but I want to give you a shot. I want to give you the invitation. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be everything that is for me. I want to invite you to stand, okay? If you want to say first that Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior in my life, I say amen, sister. I want you to be everything for me, okay? And maybe you say, I've recognized Jesus as my Lord before, but I want to rededicate today. You want to say, Jesus, I want to rededicate my life to you. I want you to be everything for me. I want you to invite you to stand as well. 
Okay? Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. You're saying, Jesus, I want to give you everything. I want to encourage you to trust in him. He has never let me down, and he will not let you down as well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that you have given us Jesus to come and to take our place there on the cross. And I ask, Jesus, that you would show us our own hearts. There are things that we're doing that we ought not to do, and sometimes we're blinded by our own desires. I want to ask, Jesus, that you would give us the gift of sight. And I also ask that you would step in to our life to fight that battle with us and for us. We're feeble. We're weak. We're just but dust. And so often our hearts are easily distracted and they wander. And so we ask Jesus that you would please don't give up on us. Fight for us. Be with us and give us the victory that you have promised. Bless all those who are here today. And I pray, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would be in our lives to lead us and direct us. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, I invite you to please uh, stand or stay standing for our closing song uh, this morning, which will be Humble Thyself in the Sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he, and he will lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Father, I want to thank you so much that if we humble ourselves, you will lift us up. And so I ask, Jesus, that today that we would be your people 100% and that you would work in our lives and through us. And I ask, Jesus, that you would continue to give each and every one of us here the joy of your salvation, the victory that you have promised. And so I ask, Jesus, that your blessing would be with us this week. Watch over us um, as we travel, wherever we may be going. And for those who are at home today, they're not feeling well, I pray, Jesus, that you would give them a speedy recovery. And I pray this in your name, dear Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to please stay with us today. We're going to have our, our fellowship meal here. We'll be having uh, haystacks, and there's lots of food, so please stay and eat. God bless you, and we'll see you then.